Business School. Um, uh, Smaya Goga from uh, UJ, uh, 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 Dr. Tanda Vilakazi also of UJ. And then um, we also um, very uh, fortunate to have uh, Ayabonga Kawe um, who wears many hats, but um, will be talking and perhaps responding to some of the, the issues that are raised, um, including um, in his advisory role uh, to the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. So I think with, without further ado, let's, uh, let's commence. Um, everybody has um, up to 15 minutes for their presentation or input. Um, and then uh, questions on the chat, um, or if you are in the auditorium, um, uh, Tando has indicated that you can uh, just uh, <coughs> alert him if you, if you would like to pose a question. Um, so, um, I think let's, let's then, uh, kick off with, uh, with Stefano, uh, Stefano, um, welcome and, uh, please, uh, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Nimrod. I'm Stefano Ponte. I'm a, uh, professor at Copenhagen Business School, but also a distinguished visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg at, uh, based at Pret. And um, so my presentation today, I was asked to um, uh, develop a little bit more um, the, the theme of sustainability uh, and uh, slash environmental issues in relation to the functioning of global value chains. Um, the book chapter is on the South African wine value chain, so I will touch on that briefly. <clears throat> but uh, I will also uh, preface that with a <clears throat> more general discussion on these broad issues. Uh, I will not develop too much in, <clears throat> sorry, in my presentation issues to do with uh, transformation and inclusion. Uh, there is some ongoing work I'm doing with Dr. Villacazzi on the fisheries industries in, and that was not included in the book that reflects a lot more directly on that and perhaps um, uh, Tando later on would have time to touch upon some of these issues. So, um, the big picture uh, that I'm going to give you in one slide here um, is uh, about sustainability and how that is being used for what I call green capital accumulation. So this is a short version of an argument I developed in a book uh, called Business Power and Sustainability in Global Value Chains uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, so the first point is that sustainability has become a key in understanding contemporary capitalism and the operation of global value chains. Sustainability is becoming and has become in many places mainstream. This is not a small, uh, a small arg uh, argument or point. When I started working on this 20 years ago, both scholars and people in industry were looking at me at this strange. It's like, so what do you mean uh, that this is really important? And now you, 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 you fast forward and it's not just about COP27 and climate change, but uh, many other aspects of sustainability have come into the boardroom, have come into the CEO office, while in the past it was uh, essentially perhaps somebody looking at it from a CSR perspective or maybe looking at environmental issues, but it wasn't really something that uh, drove uh, strategy in business. And this has become really, really central now. So if we want to understand inclusion, transformation, uh, the incorporation of uh, actors in South Africa and global value chains, we have to look at sustainability issues as well, social and environmental. Um, in my field, uh, in business studies, uh, there used to be uh, this discussion about, oh yeah, sustainability and environment is all very good as long as we can make money and therefore if there is a sustainability uh, a business case. That discussion is really uh, being solved in a sense that, first of all, in many cases there is a business case, there is profitability to be done, not always, and part of my uh, presentation will be on those kind of problems. But the fact that there is, there are other reputational issues, other issues of uh, the way in which branding and marketing is done, that has included a lot of very important sustainability issues, even though they may not be profitable in the short term in terms of product, it has really important implications in terms of market valuation and their reputation vis-a-vis uh, -vis consumers and regulators. The second point I want to make here is that Lead firms in global value chains leverage sustainability to maximize what I call green capital accumulation. Um, they're really focused on creating and capturing new value through sustainability. If they don't create it themselves, they will have their suppliers to create it and then normally pay the same price for the same 
uh, product and service, only that they get those green credentials. And then they turn around to consumers and, you know, if they can, they would uh, uh, increase their profitability and margins. Um, but it, that's not only about that. It's about portfolio diversification. It's about uh, having a variety of, uh, of different uh, qualities uh, in various kinds of products, including those that are greener, that where you can get a, um, uh, a premium. As I just uh, mentioned, it's about minim minim minimizing reputational risk. And uh, very often it is about softening regulatory demands. If I am seen as, as a lead firm in the value chain, be seen as I, I do something about sustainability, I can also lobby with uh, regulators to say, you don't really need to come hard on us because we're doing it already. Okay? And that has been used over and over in order to soften some regulatory interventions that would otherwise be placed, especially in not so green industries and value chains. Now, the third point that is uh, perhaps most um, relevant as well for, for this audience is that very often this uh, green capital accumulation that is, uh, that is operated by uh, lead firms comes at the cost of uh, suppliers in the global south. And very often, actually, it doesn't lead to uh, particularly uh, clear and positive impacts on the environment. So most of it is done to uh, be seen to be doing something. There's very little uh, impact analysis of what actually takes place down in the ground, on the ground, especially in relation to uh, the environment. So the, 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 the other side of the coin of capital accumulation by lead firms is what they call the sustainability supplier squeeze. Um, and it is actually, it has become uh, very openly discussed. So in the past, if this was going on, it was going on um, stealthily. Now it's part of actually strategy. Uh, lead firms are extracting value from their suppliers through demands on sustainability. By the way, those demands on sustainability of the environment, they have a much higher informational uh, content and therefore, that information is also used to, uh, in, to, to strengthen the process of uh, value uh, capture. Uh, because you have to release more information about uh, your cost structure, and therefore, uh, the buyer would have a better idea of where your margin, how much can I push before the supplier is not going to do the supply for us because this is, uh, I push too much. In this case, you actually know a lot more about how much you can push, and therefore, the bargaining power between the two parties change. Um, so that's the, the big picture. If you're interested in that, uh, you know, um, in the book, I do a lot more than this. Um, now, uh, in the book, in this particular book uh, that I'm being part of, and I'm quite happy to have been asked, um, I provided a study on the uh, global value, on the value chain for uh, wine. I've been studying wine in South Africa and elsewhere for about 20 years now, 17, 20 years. Um, and we're starting to, to do a, uh, an evolutionary case study now because I'm coming back to study uh, South African wine again. I'll tell you a bit more in, in a moment. And, um, but in order to understand where South Africa stands into the global value chain for wine, I, I would like to give you some basic facts about the global value chain itself. Broad trends, consumption is increasing both in volume and value. Uh, new markets are opening up, quite important ones, not just China, but many others as well. The value chain at the global level is driven by retailers in many countries, but there are also uh, uh, large merchants, merchant groups of wine that, uh, that impart quite, quite an important uh, uh, power relation around uh, power dynamics around the value chain. There are ma major changes that are taking a, a place on ideas on, uh, on quality and what quality means and on sustainability and what sustainability means, especially on sustainability in the past uh, 10 years. So it's actually quite, quite recent in relation to sustainability issue. Wine used to be a sort of a much far behind other uh, agri-food products, and now they're catching up quite quickly. Concentration. We have a, a relatively stable situation in the past 10, 15 years with the top four global wine merchant groups that control 10% of the global market. So it's not extreme, like in coffee, it's about 35%, the top five, 60%, uh, but it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, um, um, uh, important also considering the fragmentation of markets, both at the uh, production and the consumption level. Sustainability issues uh, started a little bit uh, early on with organic, uh, moved quite slowly, and now organic, uh, organic, organically grown grapes for the making of wine, because you can't really call organic wine for a variety of reasons, uh, is becoming fairly important in some markets, especially in Scandinavia. Uh, biodynamic is a um, another way of uh, approaching sustainability that is organic plus. It's got a different philosophy. 
but mostly it's about some broad sustainability initiatives that are uh, taken by either in consumption uh, uh, markets or in, in and very often in producing markets, uh, including integrated management, uh, which is uh, sort of a bit less than organic, but is it can be done in um, uh, agroecological areas where this is difficult. And some parts of our South Africa is actually very difficult to do organic wine because of the uh, climate situation. Carbon footprint, very new. Uh, it's coming up, but it's, uh, it's, been, um, it's been an issue in the industry, maybe uh, important, an important issue only in the last three, four years, and in South Africa only the past year. Um, so carbon footprint, so it has to do with the way in which wine transported. So there's a lot more, uh, well, there has always been bulk wine exports, but now it is becoming really more, uh, more important, not just in South Africa, but elsewhere, with the bottling on the other side, lighter bottles, uh, different, um, different kind of um, packaging materials are becoming extremely important, especially in, uh, in sort of a low to medium price range. In the top market, if you don't have a heavy, fancy bottle, uh, it's a bit difficult, uh, unless you have like the Swedish monopoly buyer that says, I don't care how much the wine costs inside, I want a light bottle anyway, and then in that case you do it anyway, because that's what they ask. There's a bit less globally on social concerns, except for fair trade, uh, wine, South Africa um, is about 75% of global uh, fair trade wine comes from South Africa. There are only uh, a bunch of other countries that qualify for that. Uh, Argentina, Chile, a little bit of wine coming from Algeria and, and other places in Northern Africa, but the essential is about the, the um, um, in South, South America and, and, and South Africa. So within that, uh, where is the place of uh, South African operators within those kind of broad trends? Um, first of all, I would say uh, South Africa was one of the early movers on, in relation to both environmental and social issues related to sustainability. Since actually uh, just after the, the opening up of the, of the market after the, the sanctions so in the, in the mid-90s, there's been a huge improvement in quality uh, portfolio of offering, uh, marketing, branding, uh, the provision of noble variety, uh, volume and consistency, so economies of scale and scope. The industry has come a long, long way in a relatively short amount of time. That's quite an amazing story. Part of that was actually um, a, uh, an early movement and very proactive movement from the industry on, on several uh, sustainability initiatives and certification. Organic and biodynamic, um, small still. Uh, part of it is agroecologically related. Uh, but part of it is that because the demand uh, until now for organic wines for South Africa has been relatively limited, and again, mostly about the, the monopolies in Canada and, and Scandinavia. And, um, biodiversity preservation uh, moved really early on in the early 2000s with the Biodiversity Wine Initiative that, that has been taken over or merged with the uh, WWF initiatives on, on biodiversity. Integrated production of wine, a system again coming up uh, now 20 years in operation, 94% of producers are certified both at the winery and the, and the, and the grape um, uh, growing level. Um, carbon footprint, very, very, very new. Uh, so this is what the big thing that is going on uh, right now. Social concerns, we had fair trade, as I said, and, and uh, uh, BE wines have been around for a while, mostly in relation to marketing. Um, there isn't that much of transformation at the, uh, at the, at the um, production, grape production level and a winemaking level. These are mostly marketing uh, sort of setups that then they would ask a particular winery to do a wine in a particular style and then put a, um, um, the, the, the brand on and, and set it. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's mostly where this thing has been moving. Vita, the uh, Wine uh, Ethical Trade Initiative, has been going around for, for a while. There's somebody here has a... Um, so can everybody else please mute um, to uh, get rid of the feedback, thanks. All right, it was fixed immediately, so that's great. Yeah, okay. And uh, Stefano, um, if you could move towards wrapping up in the next couple of minutes, yes. please. Like I'm done, essentially. And yet, uh, you look at the studies by uh, the South African industry, profitability is very low, especially at the farm level. And it has actually decreased quite dramatically between 2005 and 2016 when they did the major studies. Uh, environmental income uh, outcomes are, are very mixed. Lessons. So sustainability is being used globally, uh, opportunistically by global lead firms for marketing reputation, uh, responding to consumer regulatory pressure. There has been a, a really proactive sustainability uh, effort and a lot of initiatives in South Africa. 
but we're still uh, coming to see that there is a lack of uh, clear economic benefits on that, except that we're hanging in into those markets that are important. So but there hasn't been like a value that has been created and, and captured locally in relation to that. Um, I'm going to skip on the inclusion and empowerment thing. Uh, there isn't much going on in wine anyway. I think it's more important to look at other places where there is more regulatory pressure and, and, and tools on that, like in mining and fisheries and learn from that. Uh, the lesson here is that without those heavy uh, sort of regulatory uh, instruments, not much is going on, especially the land um, and the farm level. Now we started a new project, uh, just that's why I'm here last week. Uh, so with Rina and, and others at Cred. So uh, we started just, uh, we had a fantastic interview with the uh, wines of South Africa yesterday. That's why I seem to know more than I should. <laughs> it's very fresh in my mind. Um, and we'll be working on this for the next two or three years and trying to understand the, the, the most current uh, dynamics, not only in relation to sustainability, but also in relation to general issues of inclusion, transformation, etc. Thank you, Imran. Thank you very much, Stefano. Um, let's then go on to uh, uh, Sumaya. Stop sharing. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sumeya, and I'm from CRED at the University of Johannesburg. And today I'll be talking about structural transformation, economic power, and inequality in South Africa. Um, I'm drawing on a chapter in, a book, on the, in the book that, we've, that I've written with uh, Pamela Mondliwa, but it's also work that we've been uh, working on um, over the past uh, sort of two years, uh, sometimes with Simon as well. Um, I'd also just like to say a thank you to the editors of the book as well as the organizers of this event uh, for inviting us to do this. Um, a really great opportunity. Um, so essentially uh, what I would like to do in this talk is to, to, to try and unpack the links between power structure and inequality. Um, and what I've done in this first slide is kind of put up uh, uh, the, the thesis or the kind of conclusion of, of, of where I want to land at and then I will kind of uh, build up uh, into, into, uh, in, in, into uh, uh, explaining how we have gotten there. Um, so uh, what we are saying is that economic power has influenced poor progress of st structural transformation in South Africa, and this has impacted on inequality through income and wealth effects. Um, secondly, economic structure, and specifically this, uh, uh, the entrenched e economic structure that came through uh, it, uh, in the apartheid years and, and was kind of supported through in the post-apartheid years, uh, uh, is a source of economic power. And because of this uh, source of economic power, the relative strength of upstream industries means that their interests are, are better served than those of diverse diversified downstream industries. Um, and diversified downstream industries are, of course, important uh, because multipliers in those uh, employment multipliers, particularly in those downstream uh, uh, industries, uh, are higher. Um, and then thirdly, an inability to change these patterns of accumulation really underlines pers persistent inequality in income and wealth in South Africa. Um, so this is really where, where my talk is going to get to. Um, so we know um, that South Africa is among the most unequal countries in the world and that wealth is more uh, concentrated than income. In 2017, for instance, the richest 10% in South Africa held 86% of the total wealth. Now, while inequality is spoken about uh, in some senses ad nauseum in South Africa, um, it's not often linked to the structure of the economy and, 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 and linked uh, to um, the lack of structural transformation or, or, or how, or how um, sort of uh, looking at structural transformation can, can help to deal with issues of inequality. Um, and this is what we want to actually deal with here. Um, so what role can structural transformation play in, in reducing inequality? And what has the lack of structural transformation in South Africa meant uh, in terms of uh, uh, the outcomes we see, which is that we are uh, uh, among the most unequal countries in the world, if not the most unequal country in the world. Um, so as a stylized fact, we know that the South African economy is do dominated by large firms and there's high level of concentration. And the argument that we are making here is that the economic power of these large firms repro reproduces the economic structure, which then undermines uh, 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 reductions in, in inequality. And this dynamic will continue to re reproduce itself unless changes are made to the mechanisms that drive it. Um, so what do we mean by economic power? Now, there's, you know, as we're writing these, this paper, there were numerous definitions of economic power that uh, that really popped up. But what we're talking about here is really a conception that's beyond uh, the conception of just market power. And it's, it re really deals with the idea of kind of uh, a coercive power, uh, uh, sorry, not coercive power. Uh, it, it really deals with the notion of more subtle exertions of power. Um, and so power that influences what we are calling the rules of the game. 
Um, so the rules of the game being how, how is this power used to shape agenda? How is this power used to shape policy? And how is this uh, power used to shape law? Uh, in other words, with these sort of large firms and the entrenched positions of these large firms, their monopoly position then translates into a capture of political power that reinforces this position and is then evident in the kinds of core uh, policies and the kinds of regulations um, and in the kinds uh, 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 of, of, of policy positions that, that government then uh, decides to institute. It also then impacts on how um, uh, on how and which kinds of uh, industries or firms are supported and, and how those industries and firms are supported. And we use um, two case studies in the book in order to show this, but I will go through uh, um, uh, through one of them uh, in the process of, uh, of this presentation. Um, so uh, we know that developing downstream capabilities is important, uh, uh, even within man manufacturing. And the failure to develop downstream uh, capabilities in manufacturing, in fact, reflects the entrenched adv uh, advantages of income and upstream firms. Uh, but together with this, there is a lack of a policy that incorporates the re recognition of that power. Um, in other words, uh, policy has not come to a point where it says uh, 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 these firms are powerful in these ways, and this is how this power is then is then uh, 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 being translated into who gets supported um, and how they get supported and what kinds of policies are being instituted. Uh, together with that, uh, we argue in this uh, chapter that there is an insufficient focus uh, in some instances uh, in downstream industries. So because of the entrenchment of the upstream industries and the, and the kind of idea that they are kind of too big to fail, um, um, they, they continue to be supported, whereas the more, uh, 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 the more downstream industries, uh, which are perhaps less, uh, 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 less well organized, uh, are in some senses uh, uh, you know, left, left, uh, to, left to, uh, uh, to kind of sort themselves out. Um, so structural change uh, in South Africa has in exacerbated inequality in two ways. Uh, in the first instances, instance, we see weak sexual deepening, particularly in manufacturing. Um, and in the second instance, we see prem uh, premature sexual transitioning from manufacturing to low-value services. Um, so the, the, uh, in, this, in this talk and, and in this chapter of the book, uh, it's really the first of those that, that we are interested in, uh, which is the weak sexual deepening. So we look at two kind of value chains uh, within manufacturing, uh, one being uh, the metals machinery equipment uh, uh, and the other one being the chemicals and plastic. But today I will just uh, kind of touch on the metals machinery. Um, so we know that manufacturing is, of course, important for reducing inequality. It's more labor absorbing. There are better jobs. Uh, it has pulling effects on other sectors. There are multiplier effects. Uh, but then even within manufacturing, the downstream more diversified in industries have higher employment multipliers. And South Africa has struggled to ensure sexual deepening within manufacturing. Uh, so when we say this, uh, what we're actually saying is, for instance, in the metals, machinery, and equipment value chain, um, uh, they, there has continued to be a focus on the upstream, which is metals, and less of a focus uh, on the downstream, uh, 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 with uh, with uh, uh, impacts as far as uh, uh, as far as uh, inequality is concerned in in the way in which we think uh, about inequality linked to structure. Um, so the failure to develop downstream industries is linked as well to the inequality of opportunity. So the lack of mechanisms to manage rents means that inequality is re uh, reinforced and in fact entrenched, which means that you maintain patterns of ownership uh, and control as well as you maintain uh, control of rents in society. Um, this also limits opportunities for entrants and smaller firms to enter and grow. Um, and here, uh, oh, uh, what we're also talking about is the, is the kind of lack of support that's been given to downstream industries. Um, and this might be in terms of uh, development finance, it might be in terms of uh, cluster initiatives, uh, the absence of growth coalitions, etc. Uh, so these two kind of forces working together, which is, uh, uh, which is that the policy support is focused on the upstream, together with a lack of policy support to support development of downstream industries uh, through cluster development finance, etc., uh, has led to these, uh, these kinds of outcomes. Um, so, as I said, uh, one of the one of the uh, kind of sectors or value chains that we looked at in the in the in the chapter of the book is the uh, metals, machinery, and equipment value chain. Uh, of course, we know that steel is a critical input uh, uh, in, into downstream industries, including in metal products and machinery. Uh, the steel industry uh, 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 through ISCO was supported by the apartheid state and continues to be supported um, as it's internationalized into. Uh, 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 into being part of the global conglomerate uh, ArcelorMittal South Africa, uh, of course, and it has continued to be supported uh, in the post-apartheid period. Um, 
So, the, so uh, uh, as a, as a kind of overall thing, uh, and and Simon alluded to this in his in his uh, in his presentation as well. Um, the upstream has performed. Uh, uh, quite well, and he, he put up that nice graph, uh, where the downstream downstream uh, has performed poorly compared to the upstream. Uh, and the reason we're saying that uh, that has happened is there has been uh, an ability to influence policy at the upstream level, uh, despite the fact that they were built up capabilities at the, at the downstream level. So while South Africa already did have capabilities uh, in the downstream metals uh, uh, and machinery sectors, uh, uh, really the the more organised and and kind of uh, bigger uh, global kind of giant uh, AMSA was uh, was was uh, kind of able to influence policy, uh, and that we see in two kind of really critical policy decisions. Um, the one, the first being the inability to negotiate development steel steel price for downstream industries. So when um, uh, when uh, ISCO uh, inter internationalized into ArcelorMittal uh, in the early 2000s, um, uh, the advantages of low cost iron ore uh, was meant to trans uh, translate into developmental steel steel price. Uh, for downstream users, but what essentially happened is that the, those negotiations were not concluded, uh, and as a matter of uh, fact, they, they, there was then uh, no agreement around how the downstream would be supported in terms of steel pricing. Uh, and what we then saw in the 2000s, in fact, was that uh, 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 Arsenal South Africa was in fact uh, pricing at import parity pricing. Um, so really, this uh, kind of uncompetitive pricing uh, led to a hollowing out of capabilities in the 2000s uh, for the downstream uh, uh, metals machinery uh, sector. Uh, uh, in addition uh, 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 to that, it, to that initial support, and, and I'm saying two critical pol policy dishes, decisions, but I've really just kind of chosen two. Um, so the second one being the uh, support for the uh, industry following the global recession of 2009. Um, so in 2016, uh, AMSA then received uh, uh, tariff support, uh, and again, uh, uh, because the you know steel industry was stu struggling and they had lobbied government, etc. Uh, and again, uh, 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 the the response from the downstream is that uh, uh, you know this was detrimental to the to their to their uh, as an input price to their uh, uh, to their businesses. Um, so the argument we are making here is that uh, that uh, uh, these big conglomerates, in this case, in the case of uh, uh, the metals machine and equipment sector have used power to influence both rent management and the rent management system. And when we say the rent management system, what we're really talking about uh, is about how policy is formulated and then uh, that policy is then uh, carried out. And when we're talking about rents, what we're talking about uh, is really uh, uh, around the pricing, uh, the import parity pricing, etc. Um, and uh, together with that, uh, there was an attempt by uh, uh, ArcelorMittal South Africa to vertically integrate backwards and to capture iron ore rights as well, <laughs> uh, which which did uh, which did uh, fall through. Um, uh, and then Dr. Zalk as well shows in his thesis uh, that there was a large outflow of funds. Uh, I think uh, sometime in the mid 2000s uh, from the ArcelorMittal South Africa group to the ArcelorMittal uh, Global Group in the form of dividends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, uh, so you see this kind of, uh, out, you know, this kind of capturing of rents and this ca kind of capturing, capturing of the rent management system. Um, so, uh, uh, Maya, uh, uh, do you want to take two minutes to to wrap up? Ah, okay. Let me just do. How does this link to inequality? And then I'll go to my final slide. So, how does this link to inequality? Because of course, what we're interested here in is uh, the lack of sectoral of, of sectoral deepening within metals machinery and how does how is this linked to inequality? Um, so there's really two kind of uh, things that I reflect on here. The first being the greater control, control over productive resources and transfer of value to the upstream. Uh, this basically means that gains are shared by a smaller group, and it's kind of a direct transfer from the poor to the rich. And the second second one is about uh, the competitiveness of the downstream industry. So the pricing uh, really had implications for business and employment growth in the downstream, which then has implications for inequality in terms of uh, income from wages, uh, and wealth creation from returns to equity. Um, and so th those are the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, the kinds of uh, uh, ways in which inequality is, is, um, uh, is impacted on. Um, so just in conclusion, South Africa has built up a significant base upon which industrialization could have been affected and sectoral deepening um, in chains such as 
chemicals to plastics and metals to machinery could have actually been uh, 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 been uh, 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 been affected. But large firms have a role to play in keeping this status quo, and this impacts on the ability to accumulate and therefore in inequality. Um, they have been more successful in terms of shaping policy, in terms of influencing ideology, and in terms of extracting support. Um, and uh, what we're really arguing here is that South in South Africa, there has been an insufficient engagement about how to reorient larger businesses for a more inclusive world. In other words, these businesses are really important, actually. But how do we get them to behave in such a way <coughs> that uh, 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 that uh, they can actually uh, help us to, uh, to deepen uh, sectors uh, such as the metals machine and equipment? So how do we really engage with these larger businesses? Sorry. My screen has gone up. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, sorry. So strategies are so. Uh, so, it, it, uh, so we're saying in, in, insufficient atten attention has been given to the underlying power, power dynamics and how they have influenced outcomes. In other words, how they have actually influenced the rules of the game. Strategies for better inclusion would be more effective if power was taken into account. And specifically, what we're talking about here is uh, the importance of condi conditionalities, the design of condi conditionalities, as well as a focus on building uh, uh, on building downstream industries. Uh, so kind of managing the upstream a little better and also uh, uh, kind of building the downstream uh, through cluster initiatives, development finance, etc. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Sumaya. Um, let's then move to uh, Tando. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Chair. All right, Chair, I see there's a uh, good hour left, and so um, let's try to use all of that time. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm to some extent picking up, I think, in, in some ways from from the issues that Maya and uh, and Stefano are raising. Um, uh, to the extent that I think Stesno gives us a good view of uh, the kind of South African value chain in global context and the power dynamics that flow right through those value chains and, and how they can shape the local context. I think Sumaya gives us a view of how local kind of large value chains that matter for this economy, that really move the needle as it were, um, uh, uh, are shaped and governed in many ways and arguably even uh, being reproduced even in some aspects of the master plan process, I would argue. Um, uh, to, to sustain or uh, to some extent reinforce um, uh, inequalities uh, in access and otherwise. And, and so I speak about here, and this is a paper co-authored with, um, uh, with Deho Busu. Uh, we're both from the CRED team. Um, and this work builds on, 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 on part of the IDTT work that looked at what is called the Black Industrialist Program uh, in South Africa. Um, I tried to link the issues in the, pro in the, in the presentation also to a broader uh, BEE discussion, which we have in the chapter. And I think some of the nuance may be lost in the presentation. So I do hope you'll engage with it um, there. And so what we were able to do um, is, is, to, is, to, is to get a chance to engage with this new program and beneficiaries of this new program called the Black Industrialist Program. I say it's new, but really it was first spoken about in about 2006, I believe. Uh, and really comes into force around 2016, 2017, I believe, uh, in terms of policy. Uh, and I'll explain to you in a moment how it actually worked. Uh, and we were able to, to some extent, survey firms that, um, a very small sample, admittedly, unfortunately, of firms that participated in that program. But at least it gives us a sense of if we were trying to rethink how we think about policy de design in the context of industrial policy, policy design that tries to uh, link the objectives of structural transformation with the objectives of inclusion, um, uh, then this might be a way to think about it, right? And so just briefly on the context in which we, we present the paper, I guess, uh, is, 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 is well known to all of us in terms of low investment, uh, sustained barriers to entry concentration. Um, but I think what is a, a widely held view that there's been very poor outcomes in terms of South Africa's Black Economic Empowerment Program. And I, I won't give too much background on the BE, assuming, hoping, uh, of course, that um, most of our audience will, will have a sense of how that has worked. <clears throat> uh, and so this particular program, just to give you a sense of where I'll finish in case I run out of time, um, is at least showing some signs that 
you can stimulate the participation uh, of black-owned manufacturing firms, right? And this is very important in that it focuses on that aspect, on that sector, black-owned manufacturing firms. And there is some early evidence, at least, and this is quite early to ev evaluate a program of this nature, uh, that these firms are making the types of investments that are certainly valuable in higher value added activities, et cetera. Um, I'll make a point later, though, that I think a, a key criticism of, 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 of the policy policymaker in this context is that you can't manage what you're not um, what you're not measuring. And I think that the data around this is, is, is something that needs to be built up. Um, and so it suggests certainly a, a potential pathway uh, in terms of how we might think about it. A key variable being that uh, unlike perhaps other funding mechanisms that have tried to support outsider firms, as it were, um, there's an aspect here which I think is quite critical in terms of the political economy of the program, which is this idea of skin in the game for the firms. Right? So uh, I'll explain a little bit where, where, where that's going a bit later. And so the question broadly, I suppose, just to frame the issues in terms of what the chapter tries to do quite quickly, uh, is to ask this question of whether this issue of inclusion uh, can go together with this issue of structural transformation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, uh, and I think in the South African context, uh, there's a real argument whether the political settlement indeed, but specifically structural transformation in however we, we manage to achieve it someday, uh, is sustainable without viable inclusion, without a kind of broad uh, social coalition, as I think Alan referred to earlier. Right? Uh, I think the recent riots, uh, which I think arguably are, are also an issue of ownership, right? Uh, you, you kind of don't burn your own house when you're rioting, right? but someone else's thing you burn might be a hint as to as to what is a serious disconnect where uh, uh, production, where investment uh, will increasingly be undermined by social um, deprivation, by social incohesion, I suppose, uh, if if not if the issues aren't treated together. And so that's kind of hopefully what the paper partly contributes to. I think that um, also the literature on, on BE, of course, is quite extensive and some fantastic authors, including Alan and others that have spoken on the topic. And where we start is to say, look, um, uh, you know, uh, I think we've documented quite well the failures of BE and its challenges and how much it hasn't achieved. Um, uh, but I think we're in a moment, certainly as a country, where if we don't engage with, uh, 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 if that literature doesn't engage with the pathways forward, then I think we're going to be uh, 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 pretty much in the same place in 10 years' time. So what does that pathway look like? And so this is what this case study hopefully starts to point at, although I think more work needs to be done. Uh, can it be linked to the structural, structural transformation process broadly? And what, what features of BE can we salvage? Right? And I'll come back to that point in the next slide. And then we look then at the case study uh, to try and test out these ideas. Um, Look, I think just to comment on where we're coming from on BE broadly, right, and everyone would know that, you know, it's a system, uh, it's a broad policy program, of course, which really gets formalized around 2003 uh, with a range of, uh, I suppose you'd call enforcement mechanisms in the system around it in terms of codes of, codes of good practice, verification, et cetera, that try to essentially get firms to report and comply over time uh, with, uh, with inclusion objectives along ownership, procurement, et cetera, from black owned firms. Um, Arguably, I think a, a, a perhaps understated benefit of the fact that we, as a country, went down the road of BE is that uh, it is firmly in the discourse of economic policymaking in the country. I do wonder whether it would be uh, if we hadn't put something on the table, right? Or if government at the time hadn't put something on the table that says, well, something's wrong. Uh, this is what we, 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 we're trying to address. Uh, and so to some extent, you're perhaps talking about a kind of necessary evil. Um, I think also there's something perhaps to salvage in terms of what I think is a, uh, a flaky but certainly well-established enforcement mechanism. And the question is, can we use that better uh, to achieve better outcomes? Right? Can we reorient, it, uh, reorient the policy itself uh, to achieve better outcomes? I think that within, and what we argue in the paper is that there's insufficient focus in the types of things that the BE policy seeks to measure on the types of things that firms actually encounter when they're trying to participate in the economy, right? So I've got a student looking at uh, how it's played out in terms of the liquid fuel sector. And if you look at the, the, the breakdown of the procurement spend target that firms need to meet, um, it's measuring the wrong things, right? It's measuring percentages of procurement. It's uh, without regard as to whether procurement is from cleaning services, black owned uh, catering firms, et cetera, right? Can we change? 
uh, that framework in terms of thinking about barriers to entry more broadly and, and almost engender a more uh, uh, genuine form of inclusion where you have black owned rivals, HDP owned rivals more broadly participating as effective rivals in the economy. Right? Um, I think there's a range of other systemic factors uh, in that if you read the 2003 DTI policy on BE, it's very clear that there was this uh, BE policy that was going to focus on the firm as it were, the corporate sector, um, but that other tools needed to work along with it, skills development, et cetera, uh, employment equity, education policy. Uh, this is touching on Anand Bofu's question earlier as well. And I don't think they have, right? And so the heavy lifting was left uh, largely to this policy that I don't think was, 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 was capable and then to other areas such as competition law, which simply cannot, at least in the current kind of neoliberal framing, engage with some of these issues. And so what were they trying to do? I think um, just quite quickly here, and I'll try and speed up, Chair. Um, the framing, at least in terms of the DG uh, of DTIC at the time, when asked about this in Parliament, was that essentially we saw as a society, uh, the initial framing of BE from 2003 and the amendments in 2014-13 as this kind of phase one, as it were, right, where you start to engage with how do you incorporate Black South Africans, uh, HDPs, into, into existing enterprises. And then he kind of talks about this idea that uh, when they were coming up with this particular policy, they were talking about a move forward, right, an evolution, as it were, into what I suppose is implicitly saying is BE 2.0 here, right? And so what does this thing do? Um, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a lot to try and capture. And so I've tried to just, um, I'll try and capture as much as I can here and then start to move towards reflections and conclusion, right? Um, so this table here is just simply showing you the types of criteria that are applied uh, and that firms need to are uh, scored against in terms of being able to access the program in the first place, right? And so you've got to essentially produce some uh, degree of evidence preempting the benefits that a particular project for which you're seeking investment will have in terms of employment or some of the categories. Not all firms obviously can contribute in, in, in all the categories, right? Um, uh, are you able to show that if we fund you or co-fund you to make this investment, you would be able to improve or reduce your costs uh, in terms of productivity in your plant, for instance, right? And the companies would have to demonstrate this. Uh, the problem with this is that we ask them this up front. We don't ask them afterwards. Uh, in terms of how they perform. But I think that's possibly an advancement of the policy di design that might need to be considered. Right? The focus is strictly on manufacturing and in particular on the IPAP sectors, which I think might be a bit broad. Um, uh, and the, the entry requirements is a range in terms of black ownership, but really it is about a black entrepreneur or a group of black entrepreneurs, black owned or HDP entrepreneurs that actually have skin in the game insofar as they're actually uh, the entrepreneur that is part of establishing the business as opposed perhaps to a fronting entrepreneur that's brought on to make the deal get over the line, right? So do you have skin in the bam? And you, you have to demonstrate, yet yes, I have put some of my money here, noting, of course, footnote that there's a real issue in terms of the access to capital for, for many black capitalists in, the, in, in, in society, right? But nonetheless, a key requirement is that you've put something on the table yourself. It creates this kind of reinforcing mechanism where the success of the enterprise uh, and your efficient use of the funding given to you uh, 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 is directly linked to your own success as well, right? And so, and so this is the kind of criteria that's featured in there. Um, there's a range in terms of types of firms that are considered. And importantly, this is a claims-based system, right? So essentially saying, uh, uh, we'll give you a grant, and I think the cap is 50 million rand, right? Um, but we'll give it to you once you've gone and bought that machine. So go and import it from wherever you're bringing it from, or bring it in and show us that this thing is now part of your production process. Essentially, you come and claim as you would if you're traveling. Uh, but what that does is that, of course, I think in some ways prevents certain types of leakage in terms of funding going out to market participants, but not nothing coming back or it being um, squandered into other into other uh, uses. And I, I am embellishing this a little bit, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Right, Chase, so I'll move to start to conclude. I have five points here. Um, I think what's interesting about this case study, and I think the chapter will give you a lot more detail on this, is that um, uh, uh, it's talking about a specific problem. I think in, in some respects, one of the key issues with BE and sector charters aside, which if you read some of them are impossibly vague anyway, but they, you know, in, in liquid fuels, it's, it's a couple of pages, right? Um, uh, but this is addressing a particular problem, which is that you want black owned manufacturing firms involved in value chains, producing widgets, and supplying them to the market, right? 
And so how do you design an incentive that they would be making real, uh, uh, real economy investments in productive assets, uh, as opposed to perhaps um, buying shares or portfolio um, assets, et cetera, right? And I think that's quite important because it suggests that this focus policy to solve a particular problem um, might be a clue as to what we need to be thinking about in IP generally, industrial policy generally. Um, the early outcomes I hinted at before, and so I'll skirt through, but um, the majority of the funds that have been dispersed are actually been used to buy machines, uh, capital equipment, uh, machinery, plant, et cetera, right? Uh, and only some of the funding is going to feasibility studies and this kind of thing, which I think is really exciting, especially in a context where we see uh, in the early IDTT reports that actually a lot of funding in the economy, even as it may exist, profitability, as Nimrod mentioned earlier, is going into portfolio assets, et cetera, right? And so at a time where growth fixed capital fix, uh, co uh, formation is flat and declining to some ex in, in some periods, uh, you actually had investment uh, in real assets. And I think that's quite interesting. Uh, in terms of labor absorption, the sectors are labor absorptive, <clears throat> but in terms of the number of firms that have been able to achieve high levels of employment, it depends on the industry. So we had a particular clothing and textile firms that was really good <laughs> and one that was manufacturing certain types of decoders, decoders if I remember correctly. Uh, Devok was online, you can correct me later, that had high employment numbers. So the picture is a bit skewed there, but there is a positive <coughs> outcome to some extent. And this will be my last slide. Um, I think a common factor in terms of, so we did the survey, but also actually spoke to a number of these firms, uh, is this issue of access to markets, right? And we talk about it, but I don't think we're spending enough time trying to understand uh, what it looks like on the ground. Is it the terms of trade being offered by large firms? Are the retailers um, offering or charging listing fees that are too high, uh, depending on the type of product, et cetera? We're not engaging with the detail of what this means, right, um, to some extent. Uh, and of course, uh, the evidence, at least even from the DTIC, is that your SOEs have completely not come on board in terms of sourcing from these firms, right? And it's a huge stumbling block, of course. Um, interestingly, one of the firms we followed up with subsequently says, uh, I've been trying for two or three years to get onto the shelves of pick and pay. They produce sources. They have a whole plant who went and saw it, where they produce these condiments and things, right? Own brand, locally manufactured, black-owned fur. And he says, I've been trying to get on the shelves of pick and pay for years now, right? And it was only after I cornered uh, 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 one of the lead executives of pick and pay at a public platform like this, and I said, you always talk about inclusion, but you don't do it. Two weeks later, I was on the shelves. I had an agreement to get onto the shelves. It means it's possible. It means that the products are good enough, right? It means that there isn't some objective criteria. It means that we're not engaging at the right level with the retailers in this particular value chain. And I think this would apply across sectors as well. Um, yeah, and I think maybe just to make a few uh, uh, final points here, which is that I think this also needs to come with the system of development finance that's actually geared uh, to, to developing rivals that absorbs risk. It's not enough to say, uh, you know, for instance, the IDC runs on its own balance sheet, and so here we are. I think we need to solve the problem, right? Is the model of Benedes uh, more effective in terms of where it's situated relative to, uh, in terms of its own kind of uh, institutional structure? because then we need to explore that, right? This cannot be an enduring constraint because the, the, the cost is too high in the economy. Right? Uh, and this also speaks about, um, uh, I think that we need more case studies around this type of thing because uh, it may well be that it's upon us not to, uh, 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 to point the finger at the industrial policy, but also start thinking about how you design these systems better. And it, this may well entail more behavioral economics thinking or whatever it might be, but we need to get there. Lastly, I think what works with this program that I think is potentially problematic in other areas um, is that it would require significant state capacity to replicate, right? Um, otherwise, you need to design them in ways that can be self-reinforcing. And I think the Renewable Energies Program is an example of, 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 of something that could be useful there. I don't know if BIS can survive, um, BIS and Black Industrial Steam can uh, survive austerity. Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, but again, just to echo the earlier points, uh, these things kind of need to work together in terms of macro policy as well. Right, I say too much. Thank you, Chip. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Tando. Um, so we'll give the last word to um, Ayabonga. Um, uh, yeah, um, and I understand you you don't have a presentation, but you're just going to uh, make some reflections. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, unmandated reflections, I must add, um, <laughs> so that uh, it, you know it doesn't come across as if. Um, one, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth, uh, but also two, that um, some of the things I'm going to say are the positions of, um, 
of any of my employers. Um, so thank you very much, uh, I guess, to the colleagues who have uh, given the presentations and uh, to you, Chair, as well. Um, and I think briefly, I mean, many of the colleagues have covered a lot of uh, what I wanted to, to reflect on. Um, and so in a way, I'm going to try and use a lot of what they've said as entry points into what I want to talk about. Um, I think, you know, the first two presentations are very indicative of, of the importance of trying to think through even the global push and prioritization of issues of sustainability with our own transformation that we need to undertake here in South Africa. And I think there's a big concern often that when we talk about structural reforms, we sometimes like to speak of those as if they are synonymous with structural transformation. Uh, and in many instances, it's not the same thing. Um, if uh, one goes deeper and tries to understand what some people are suggesting when they speak about structural reforms, one gets a sense that it's a combination of microeconomic reforms and reforms at an organizational and bureaucratic level um, that are aimed at achieving particular outcomes in specific uh, microeconomic environments. Whereas I think the formulation of structural change and how we navigate that alongside sustainability, alongside inclusion, empowerment and transformation is a much more helpful formulation because what it does is that it marries many of the society-wide transitions that we faced with and this unparalleled social change that we faced with, with the need to transform the basis, uh, be it in production, distribution, and exchange of, of our entire economy. So, so I wanted to make that point because I think it does link in very meaningful ways with the comments that uh, both uh, Sumeya and uh, Tando have been making around rent management. Um, now, let me maybe start off, I guess, with, with Stefano's earlier comment around, um, you know, the area of wine. Um, and, and maybe, Stefano, you must invite us to some of these interviews, if indeed there will be, I guess, uh, some, some wine at the tail end. Um, I'm certainly quite partial to Merlot myself. So now, now, now I do think that, you know, one of the things that has come with competition amendments um, and in how we frame the issue of public interest is to think about how we improve the basis on which many national industries, and I would add the wine sector is one of these, are able to compete globally. So yes, you want to transform at a microeconomic level, but you also want to pay due consideration to the ability of some of your national industries to compete internationally. And I think in the case of, of, of the wine industry in South Africa, coming as it does from the history of the DOP system, uh, and even of course, uh, continuing challenges around you know, wages in that particular sector and the social relations that accompany the production and the export of wine in South Africa. Um, one can't resolve questions of sustainability or see those as things that you want to do for an international audience without resolving some of the big weighty issues that are happening in the world. And I think, you know, some people might see that as a challenge, but I think it's an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity to really, I guess, see some alignment of interest between those who are wanting uh, to sell and to even market South African wine in global markets on a different basis, but also to try and change, even for the domestic and the continental market, um, how that particular wine and the conditions under which it's produced uh, happens. So I wanted to make that comment. But I think Sumaya makes a very important point around this notion of economic power and the role of the capture of rents and policy instruments uh, in how we understand that power. Because you can't divorce it from the challenges of deindustrialization and the premature deindustrialization of the South African economy. But also, I'm quite interested, I guess, when we think about it and we extend it to BEE, because I do think that BEE is a rent. Um, now, I'm quite interested in how we embed this issue of a culture of reciprocity in the instruments of BEE. So, so Tando, for instance, speaks about some of the industrialists um, that not only benefit from BEE primarily through some of the instruments of support, but might also benefit from the implications in the procurement framework that effectively pre-qualify or present an opportunity for some of these players to access public spending and even to benefit from private spending in cases where firms you know, uh, uh, get much better points for enterprise and supply development and the like. Now, the big failure of the first phase of BE in many ways has been to think of it just as a capital reform initiative, to think of it as the just the exchange of, in some cases, values, um, without an attendant obligation on saying, 
what reciprocal obligation do we place on those who benefit from the policy framework by way of reinvestment, by way of reinvestment in the real economy? Uh, and I think there's big question marks around what implications that has for distributional decisions um, in many of the firms uh, that we're talking about. I think the other element of um, BE in the evolution of it that has been quite interesting, uh, and it's something that we're grappling with at the moment, is around how do you think about the role of collective and broad-based schemes within the ambit of what we're talking about. So not only just uh, necessarily in the case of um, you know, uh, worker schemes, but also in the case of uh, community schemes. What becomes the basis of the economic interests of those community schemes rather than just an expectation of a dividend? And is there scope to use some of those collective instruments, not just um, seeing it as the sum of the individual parts, but rather see those collective instruments as vehicles in the hands of particular communities and societies uh, to be able to not only lay claim to uh, economic flows that come out of these firms, but to do so in a way that improves uh, the productive base of many of the areas that they come from. By no stretch of the imagination is that a complete undertaking, and I think I'd be interested to hear from colleagues uh, what that means uh, and, and how they are viewing that. I think the other element, if we're talking about the management of rents that I want to touch on, is around this issue of pricing regulation, not only just the pricing of finance, but also the pricing of inputs, the pricing of logistics, the pricing of all of the things that are critical, one, to firm level profitability, but also critical to sustained forms of accumulation that are able uh, to stem the tide of, uh, of deindustrialization. And in many cases, a lot of people, you know, within the broader neoclassical framework have been quite averse uh, to even talking about how do you, in instances where there's a transfer, uh, um, you know, or an exchange um, of economic interests between different parties, how do you begin to lock in these terms that are much more favorable for your target or designated groups uh, in terms of the pricing of finance, in terms of the pricing of inputs, and in terms of the pricing of the logistics, and many other firm level considerations that are critical uh, uh, to the viability of many of these industries, and see that in complementary fashion to opening up markets. Because I think opening up markets um, is a very necessary and a very important thing, but is insufficient if you are not able to deal with, at a firm level, what some of the challenges might be. Uh, one, to be able to compete uh, on, a, on a basis, um, not only from a cost perspective, uh, but on a basis that really allows these players uh, to compete on a, fair, on a fair footing. Now, maybe just as my last comment, um, or maybe last, I guess, two sets of comments. Um, the first one I want to make is, I, I think if we come back to this notion of power and the role of power in influencing outcomes, in a context of structural changes that are going to happen with or without us, with or without the policy actions or the interventions uh, or the management of rents in the way that we are suggesting, then we kind of have to deal with old vestiges of power that are reproducing themselves in new spaces. And one of the examples of this is uh, when people speak about green hydrogen in South Africa um, and the critical role of you know, relatively cost-effective forms of renewable energy as a feedstock into green hydrogen, and by extension, how that influences the ability of, you know, a, a sector like the automotive sector uh, to compete in its main traditional markets in places like Europe in the context of stringent emission policy shifts that are happening. There. Now, there's the urgency of the issue on the one hand, but the urgency of the issue cannot displace our concerns around the distribution of power in that space. We speak about a minerals energy complex, but as we go towards this, you know, um, energy transition that we want to be a just transition, what does it mean to replicate the old forms of the interface between primary extraction of commodities, this case, I guess, uh, platinum group metals and some of the other metals that are critical to, uh, you know, to the... Um, green energy value chain, both here at home and in the region. And more importantly, what does it then mean for the industrial base that we want um, when we fully accept that a big part of the technologies and key lead firms in that value chain um, are international firms? How do we deal with that 
and does BEE give us an effective instrument to be able to, to achieve some of the things that we might, might want to achieve on that score? And I would argue the same is the case if we consider the connectivity and the digital and ICT ecosystem and value chains, especially insofar as the monetization of, of data is concerned and sovereignty over uh, a data flows that might be produced here but are monetized elsewhere. And how do we deal with some of those issues when we know there's massive lead firms that have incumbency and dominant market positions that make it very difficult uh, uh, to open up those spaces, create access to market, let alone uh, uh, use some of the instruments at our disposal to make sure that that entry is on terms that are favorable rather than adverse incorporation. And I think maybe the last thing I want to speak about are some of the coordination issues that Tando was raising. I, I think I agree, Tando, there are massive limits to corporatist arrangements, be it at NEDLAC or even in the master plans. Um, but I'm also interested in how do we use some of these initiatives to advance our public discussions beyond just uh, you know, a narrow focus on these are the few reforms that get us to where we want to be. As important as those are, there also is a need to look at what are some of the critical social, digital, and energy transitions that we need to grapple with. And how do our existing instruments respond to that? But also, I do think in a very meaningful way that there's been an advance even beyond BE 2.0 in starting to think about BE not just as a measure to try and create a new layer or a new commercial class or a new capitalist class in the society, but to try and use it as an instrument to really engage with the broader division of wealth in the society, coming back to Sumeya's question. And of course, one of the ways in which we do that is to also broaden the ambit of what we think ownership is and how that ownership is linked to questions of direct economic interest. And I'd, uh, I'd be interested in, in what colleagues might think about that, because it does seem uh, on these issues of coordination that there are coordination challenges at the level of the instruments, but there are also coordination challenges at the level of the institutions that have purview, oversight, and of course, uh, authority and power over some of the institutions as well. Maybe a last comment, I guess, and it, uh, some reflections on the riots and what they teach us about this. Um, I make this point because I, I do think that many of the issues that we're faced with are about how do you diversify what is produced in the first instance, in the second instance, where it is produced, and of course, the terms on which that is produced. And if one looks at how many of our industrial assets that come from the earlier industrial decentralization of Pakistan era were pilfered, were vandalized in, in very particular fashion, one gets to the realization that in many places, Dimbaza, Istebe, and Mandeni, uh, and even in the older you know, uh, parts of uh, Newcastle, that you still have these relations where many of what we see as sites of production um, remain enclaves alongside very, very little other production that interfaces with those uh, that is happening. And, and we lament this in retail, where we say the value chains and the supply chains are long. But I think adequate attention also needs to be paid in uh, some of the areas that are traditionally, you know, areas that are recipients of industrial policy support, and to start to think about what role do they play continually as we think about our global value chains, not just from the perspective of uh, efficiency, but also uh, localized forms of production that make the production process much more resilient, that reduce lead, uh, lead times, uh, but also shorten some of these very, very long value chains that we have, uh, so that you're able to create a basis for economic inclusion that people can see. Because without that, uh, you're going to continue to see some of these, at times, even informal adaptations of these policies, uh, of these rents, if I can put it that way, uh, that give rise to some of the phenomenon that we've seen of the 30% and uh, many of the other claims, uh, which are overtly political, uh, but also interface in many instances with uh, criminal elements uh, in many of our communities. So I want to pause there and uh, once again, thank the team at CRED for the invite um, and uh, also to you, Chair, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ayabonga. Um, I think uh, the timing is is just about perfect, uh, given that we started a couple of minutes late. Um, so we are really now into the question and answer component of the session. Um, I've been scouring the um, 
uh, the participant list and the chat. Um, and I don't see any hands uh, as yet or any comments on the chat. Um, I did have a couple of points um, that I wanted to raise myself. Um, the first is um, in relation to Stefano's uh, presentation. Um, you know, this, uh, how can I, I think what you're calling, um, uh, you know, opportunistic approaches to uh, greening of uh, particular industries. Um, the one, uh, you know, there's one similar sect, not similar, but uh, sector in which I think similar dynamics are on, unfolding uh, that, that struck me when, when you were talking is, you know, is what, what is happening in parts of the mineral sector, particularly the coal sector, where you've got large um, transnational uh, mining companies who have a legacy of having produced um, uh, coal and, and other damaging minerals, um, which have, uh, you know, contributed to uh, the accumulation of uh, CO2 buildup in the atmosphere. But essentially what they're doing is they're just, they're offloading those assets. Um, in the South African case, I think that they that, that what's happening is they're being offloaded um, and, uh, you know, and, and part of it is saying, well, we're promoting black economic empowerment by offloading coal assets to, to uh, you know, to black owners. Um, but um, I think there is a danger that, you know, that uh, first of all, that, you know, that, that this is kind of, you know, really just washing their hands of, uh, of, of, of their own legacy. Um, also that there is a risk that one, you know, that, that they are placing companies, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of black owned companies in, in sectors that, you know, that, that have a limited shelf life that might be a dead end. Um, so that was the one issue, the one question. Um, I had some others, but I see now um, there is at least one um, uh, question from the chat. Um, uh, Fiona and, and then Simon uh, both have questions. Okay, thanks, I, I really enjoyed that with the, the presentation. Um, my question is in particular to, to Samaya and uh, someone else that I want to present. So, in your thinking around the relationship. Fiona, I'm sorry, I'm sure people can hear you in the auditorium, but um, I'm struggling to hear you um, online and I think perhaps uh, everybody else. Uh, anybody can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very clearly, Tando. Your laptop's in front of your mic. That might uh, be move the yeah. computer, I think, really bad. Um, is it audible now? It's a it's a little bit better, but anyway, go go ahead, please. How about now? Um, yeah, it's it's not great, but I think I think we can make it out. You can do yeah. it. Um, okay, well, I'll I'll come and sit next to you so my at least she will be able to to hear me. Yes, that, that, uh, that's way better. Okay, great. Um, you know, it's really to, to probe a bit further the, the thinking around the relationship between inequality and structural transformation. It's a, I think it's a, it's a key relationship and something which sometimes we um, neglect. Um, and in particular, the, how you see the link between kind of uh, social spending and industrial policy, um, something which is a bit uh, quite topical. And I guess there's, you know, there's, there's different dimensions to it. Uh, you know, one which sees a, a kind of trade-off um, in the sense that uh, resources are limited and um, there, there are real choices of, of where to allocate uh, funds. Um, you know, where do you prioritize and say, well, let's focus on jobs and on structural transformation, industrial policy, um, and hope that kind of uh, uh, redistribution and uh, inclusion and so on um, will follow. Um, or do you, um, are these things that uh, can be pursued um, simultaneously? Where do you see the kind of trade-offs and uh, complementarities? Uh, yeah. I suppose that there's no straightforward answer, but um, really, yeah, any reflections would be interesting. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, shall I shall I answer that? 
Um, shall we, because uh, Simon also has his hand up, why don't we take Simon's input and then take a round of responses, please? Great. Sure, I'm hoping, yes, that sounds good. I'm standing by a microphone. <laughs> We're learning a bit about uh, this event management as we go along. Um, yeah, my question's um, mainly for Ayabonga. Um, and really to, to push a bit harder, I think, on some of the specifics. I really enjoyed the presentation. It's a really essential topic. I think we're all really um, uh, uh, I'm sure on the same page about the importance of understanding market power and economic power in, in multidimensional uh, uh, ways. And I think um, just as an aside, I think it's really interesting looking at the developments of competition law related to digital platforms in many of the EU jurisdictions, where they're now recognizing the importance of multidimensional understandings of, of power because they're facing up to platforms, but the kinds of things that they're proposing, such as designating firms as having strategic market status or a paramount significance uh, across markets, are the kind of things that may apply to, um, to uh, firms that aren't necessarily digital platforms in countries like, like South Africa. So I wanted to push on a couple of things. One is like, what can we understand from, from public interest in mergers with a specific uh, maybe reference to looking at uh, supermarkets as the routes to market? Uh, supermarkets are, you know, the, by their very nature, they structure and shape uh, consumer decisions, as, as, as Tando was saying in his, in his presentation. We've seen these public interest uh, measures coming in through in supermarkets, but the question that I have is, is what, should we not be thinking about them in a, in a much more central role? Uh, and I know the biopower regulations are, you know, are there, but this to me does not seem to be a substitute for essentially kind of a, a groceries code of conduct, which is things that other countries ha have got, and bringing the supplier uh, measures, development measures, into uh, a more structured set of soft regulations, if you like, expectations, but expectations that are spelt out um, quite clearly. Uh, rather than kind of best endeavors type of expectations uh, or in the ad hoc sense of coming up in terms of, of merger uh, when we have mergers and public interest there. So, thanks. Great. Um, thanks for that. Um, so, yeah, I think let's, um, uh, you know, just ask the panel members to respond. Um, why don't we go in reverse order uh, to which uh, people spoke, uh, starting with Ayabonga? Sorry. Let me just, uh, can you hear me now? So let me just put my yes. camera on. Um, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for that question. Um, look, I mean, I think you're right. Um, supermarkets are not are not important just by virtue of, um, you know, giving us day-to-day -day essentials, but they are also, as you rightfully say, a conduit to the market and a critical conduit in our food system to the market. And I think you would have seen in the grocery retail market inquiry that was done by the ComCom, um, how, maybe what is the word? Um, how ambitious maybe some of the expectations had been of some of the supermarket players. So, for instance, while some of them might have accepted uh, doing away with exclusive tenant leases um, and the issues around buyer power, um, which, of course, there was a bit of, um, I guess, um, you know, at times even a lukewarm reception to. Uh, but I think many of them have been quite reluctant to go to, in this direction of a voluntary code. Um, and I'm not too sure why that has been the case. Um, uh, and I think we would benefit from that particular thing. But I think the other dimension we ha might have to think about is this interface between, you know, property players, real estate investment trusts, the retailers themselves, and the financial services sector. Because I think that even if you did have a code with the retailers themselves, you would not be able to resolve some of the issues that, yes, are related to how products get to the shelf, but also the operating environment around those supermarkets if you don't deal with getting all of those three players into the room. Um, and I think that that is important. I think the other thing that comes out of the retail sector, which might, in my view, be helpful for how we also think about the platform economy and some of the issues around platforms, is that for the longest time, how we've thought of this is, you know, this whole consumer welfare idea. So in the neoclassical sense of, you know, you can pass through cheaper prices to the consumer, then you tend to, I guess, be a bit lenient on some of the economic power questions. And yet, 
what we're starting to see, if one considers the buyer power discussion, is that you know there's a distributional consequence of that. So the squeezing of the suppliers and the squeezing of many other economic actors, uh, you know, uh, before the products even get to the shelves, is what leads to these lower prices. And I think in the case of the platforms as well, uh, if price is just the entry point, or, or if we still think price is, you know, the best allocative mechanism. Um, and on the basis of that, we determine our analysis of the market structure and the com competition questions there, as many people still do. Um, not necessarily the competition authorities, but I think you hear it in what people are suggesting that we're a price leader and therefore on that basis, uh, the public interest and the competition issues um, are covered. Uh, I think we need to widen the ambit of what we're thinking about, both in the uh, supermarket space, but also as it relates to some of these digital platforms. Uh, because I don't think price in the configuration of those markets is still uh, a very good indicator of uh, not only just consumer welfare, but societal welfare and uh, is something that is in the public interest. Um, I don't know, Simon, if that answers your question, but I, I, I do think on the question of a code of conduct um, that that is something within the framework, once again, of, of how we've approached BEE and how we've approached empowerment is to allow people first to do it voluntarily. Um, but I think the concern at the moment is, you know, if people aren't willing to come to the party and really make meaningful commitments on some of these things, uh, then there might, I guess, be the other option that the grocery uh, retail market inquiry makes provision for, uh, which is uh, this consideration of how do you uh, think about, you know, using your regulatory functions to deal with some of these issues. Because uh, I think you're right. I mean, the other element of it is also how do we build... You know, a lot of people in how we've done PE in the past has been around sectors that need the state for licenses and need the state for procurement. And I think the retail sector has gone um, and felt that PE is not something that might be front of center and front of mind for them, because in a sense, they don't need, I guess, licenses in, in the traditional sense of, say, the telecom space or the mining space, uh, you know, from the government. But if you think about the massive amounts of money paid in social grants that make a one-way trip into many of the retailers, then you know this issue of coordination of instruments and institutions becomes very important. And I think there's institutions that haven't been part of the conversation, uh, such as the Department of Social Development in SASA, that might need to be part of the conversation there. So I'll, I'll pause there on that score. Thanks, thanks, Ayabonga. Um, let's then go to Tando. Uh, Tando, do you want to respond to any of the issues? Sure, I'd like to. I'm sure, you do. A little, <laughs> a little bit. Chair, um, on that last point, I think, um, uh, I think this question that I was asking is, is also one of of of, of leverage. I mean, uh, Stephen and I have just been looking at what are actually fantastic BE scores in the fishing industry, right? And of course, that's because the state allocates uh, quotas. And so there was real incentive to um, to to comply even outside of an industry charter, right? Um, we're trying to understand why it is that that works, and I think part of it is that the the BE requirement is part of a set of requirements, right? So what we ended up with is a very soft policy in that industry in terms of a balance of transformation and economic efficiency EA considerations in 2005. Um, but surprise, surprise, um, even on what I argued earlier to be the wrong measures, it's probably one of the, one of the highest performing sectors in terms of, of BEE scores. So there's a magic there that we need to understand and then ask the question of whether the same would happen if we, if we were setting different targets, if we were asking them to now include uh, black-owned processes as part of their value chains before exporting internationally, et cetera. I think that's where we need to start picking uh, when talking about BEE as well. Um, I agree with I as well that, of course, these different transitions, digitalization, et cetera, um, uh, uh, all matter. And I think sustainability are going to move the needle and going to think, have to think afresh. Uh, my real question is who will get to participate uh, once we get the policy programs right, once um, we enter into certain global value chains, uh, once we're in the middle of a process of, just, of a just transition, um, arguably, uh, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if the same firms, lead firms, um, uh, that we currently know would be participating in, in, in controlling rents in those processes as well. And I think that's on us if that does happen. Um, maybe just a couple more points, Chair. Uh, interestingly, on the banks, I agree with Aya here. I think uh, 
what's interesting is that in what is actually a development coalition forming process, although I would argue it's not true form, is this master plan process that's going on across about 17 economic sectors in South Africa. And uh, on the one that I've had a chance to work with with the team, the banks are not in the room. So we're talking about all sorts of objectives about how we're going to empower these farmers and those growers and those producers, and the banks are not going to play ball when the time comes. And I think this is what we're missing. We need this kind of more um, uh, uh, focal point kind of uh, coordinated approach to these types of interventions, because I think the risk is that the master plans will get captured, right? They will be captured by large, high employing firms um, that uh, are in danger because there's been global shifts in their value chains. We will put up export tariffs to, uh, tariffs to protect them, and then we will entrench what is otherwise uh, actually a very durable, long-standing dominance. And I think that's potentially problematic in the long term. Um, I think that's it, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tando. Uh, Sumaya? Yeah, this is an interesting question uh, around, around balancing these things. I think I'd like to start here by talking about what the state of exclusion is in South Africa, <laughs> because this is something we kind of, I think, forget not forget, but kind of it's, it's, it's jarring to me every time I think about it. So I looked at the unemployment rate today on the broad unemployment rate, that is people that are not looking for work. This stands at like an astounding 44%. 44% of those that are looking for work um, are, are, are either not looking anymore or they can't find work. In addition, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, uh, pretty much. Um, so, of course, in the post-apartheid period, we've seen this increase in kind of social grants and we've seen an, uh, uh, an increase in these, in these kinds of transfers. Uh, but I think it's this, this, this idea that, uh, that uh, you know, in these 25 years, um, this, the state of, inclusion, uh, of exclusion has not actually moved that much. In fact, broad unemployment rates have gone up. Uh, in fact, inequality has increased. Uh, so, so, so we're looking at an economy that's really kind of really, really struggling. Um, so I would say that uh, the balance kind of between the two doesn't lie in, in one or the other. Both of them are absolutely necessary. And they're absolutely necessary from the, from, from the perspective of both uh, a, a simple thing like, like getting out of poverty for people that are just able to live, but it's also important from the perspective of demand. In an economy that you that that is not uh, uh, giving, you know, and you hear these horror stories of like people uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 you know advertising hundred jobs and like like you know five thousand people are standing in queue for, in, in a queue for that job. So in in, the, in that context, I think uh, both are absolutely necessary. Um, yeah, I guess the structural transformation inequality story is a kind of more medium, longer term goal. Uh, but uh, in the shorter term, I think the state of exclusion, as well as this idea that demand has to be stimulated in some way, given that unemployment is so high, um, that those things are absolutely ne necessary. Having said that, it is clear that South Africa is, is, is kind of coming into a fiscal constraint. Uh, and so hard decisions have to be made. Um, so the ability to kind of use social grants and the ability to kind of do uh, transfers, I think, is going to be increasingly limited. Uh, and so in some ways that forces uh, South Africa, which it hasn't done in the last uh, kind of 25 years, to think more, uh, uh, more creatively around development and, uh, more, and development in a, in a kind of medium, uh, longer term way. Otherwise, as, you, as we have seen last year with the riots and as we see with increasing uh, uh, service delivery uh, strikes and and just generally, you know, increases in crime, etc. Uh, it it really is un unsustainable. Thanks, Maya. Um, I know that we this uh, discussion could go on for uh, way longer, um, but I, I think uh, Stefano, I'll give you the last word, uh, and then unfortunately we'll have to close the session. All right, thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, I think out of the many good questions, I, um, I'm going to address two in particular. One uh, by Abonga, I think he hit the nail on the head, straight ahead, um, when he says that uh, in relation to wine, but also many other industries, you can't really resolve issues related to environmental sustainability without tackling the other big issues there, wages, uh, employment relations, social relations, uh, historical legacy of, of um, of these of these relations, and and this is actually uh, um, an indica an indicator of a much broader trend of slicing up different aspects of sustainability in order to isolate one problem and then uh, pretending that you're going to uh, uh, solve a broader set of issues, and and this happens all the time, and especially in between environmental and social issues. In some ways, environmental issues are more di they are difficult to to handle 
uh, but they're more uh, sort of easy to justify in, 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 the, current, uh, in the current political climate. Um, and I, I would push it even, even further uh, that sometimes environmental issues are used in order not to uh, uh, tackle social issues. And this is very, very uh, clear in our fisheries work in which the justification for not opening up to other players in the industry is based on sustainability on the environmental side and Marine Stewardship Council certification on the Hake industry because the argument is that, one of the arguments is that if you have more players, then it's going to be more difficult to ensure environmental sustainability. So it's even, it's even worse than we think. The second point is uh, also building on something that I have longer said, but also uh, uh, Nimrod and, he, and his point about where, uh, what are we, what are we, uh, uh, what kind of inclusion and what kind of redistribution are we are we doing in certain sectors in relation, in, in this case, of this um, uh, uh, giving out of the brown industries that are uh, that, that are moving moving out and and, and being uh, uh, they will be around only for a short time. Um, that 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 happens also in relation to the second slicing up and the sort of slicing up around, along the value chain. So again, going back to fisheries, you have a process of uh, black economic empowerment and, and, and redistribution, even though it's a, it's a relatively limited one, at the node of the value chain that has the lowest profitability, which is fish capture. And then when you, you go on to fish processing, exporting, uh, there is nothing else there of, of the same regulatory power that can make a difference Then you go into the general BE. Um, uh, sort of frame and that there is a lot less going on there. So in these two cases and many others, so we need to be really attentive about what exactly are we um, are we uh, providing in terms of inclusion and therefore also an argument that uh, various people as a cred are developing uh, that that competition law alone cannot actually deal with these vertical issues, especially if you in terms of the slicing up the value chain in terms of entry, um, entry barriers and in terms of uh, value value added distribution because uh, competition law is very good on horizontal issues and therefore as long as we only or mainly use that uh, then we're going to fall short. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so thanks again to to all the panelists. Um, I, I do see that there was one hand that was put up um, while uh, the panelists were responding. What I'd like to suggest is if you wouldn't mind putting your question in the in the chat and then hopefully uh, and, and also perhaps indicate who you would like to answer and hopefully um, it can be answered uh, through the chat. Um, but uh, we have unfortunately run out of time. So thanks again to everybody. Um, and that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you, Nimrod. Um, my apologies also, I didn't actually take a round of questions uh, in the room. Uh, uh, but of course, if there are any, please um, uh, do uh, put those in the chat. Um, that's, that's entirely on me. Um, so I think we will take uh, a 15 minute break now uh, to stretch our legs and then we'll come in uh, for what I think will be a really exciting discussion uh, on, on digital industrialization issues uh, in the final session. So uh, let's see each other at quarter past the hour. Uh, depending on where you are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. You can. Because the I know, I know. <laughs>